Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. And while you're on the way over there, I'm going to read to you from John chapter 12, which is a passage of Scripture that we noted at the very outset of the study. John chapter 12, uh, beginning in um, verse 36. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. And when Jesus had said these things, uh, he departed. And though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah says, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So John is quoting Isaiah twice in this passage and noting the unbelief of Israel. Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. That is Christ, and spoke of him. So when we think about the vision of Isaiah and the ministry of Jesus, there is a deep, profound connection, which we need to take up right at the outset when we come to the words in Isaiah 6. John, the writer of the gospel, says, that the reason Isaiah said what he said is because he saw Christ. And when Isaiah spoke, he spoke of Christ. So when somebody asks, well, what is Isaiah about? Let me remind you this morning that it has been called the fifth gospel. It reveals Christ. And in some ways, that is simply not in terms of the prophetic words about Christ being the suffering servant and so on, and the promises of restoration and global and cosmic salvation. But also in this text right here in Isaiah chapter 6, where again John says, he saw his glory. What's John referring to? Well, he's referring to this vision that takes place in this chapter. So in Isaiah 6, Uh, We read these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, would you say the next words with me? I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. For I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go. And say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, 
but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. Make their ears heavy and their eyes blind, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. And that's the word of the Lord. All right, so what's before us today is unpacking this remarkable vision. Let's remember that this is part of this larger literary section, 1 through 12, and it stands right in the middle of it. So sometimes a prophet's commission occurs at the very beginning of the book. That would seem to be a logical place for it. It's placed over here because of that unique literary structure so that we're drawn through this initial section to this very moment. This is the highlight of chapters 1 through 12. Isaiah is seeing the Lord and is experiencing in himself the narrative, the story of God's own work in his people, calling him, calling them to himself, revealing himself to them, cleansing them with fire, and renewing in them the mission and the call that they have to bear witness in the whole world. So we need to look at this vision in particular because it, it stands out so prominently and it shapes so much of the rest of the Scripture and, of course, is shaped by other Scriptures as well. Let's think for just a minute here about Isaiah experiencing a vision a vision of God's glory. He's not alone in that regard. Moses has such a vision, doesn't he, of God's glory. He's summoned up on Mount Sinai, but that's not where it begins. The first vision that Moses has of God's glory takes place in the wilderness while he's tending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, and he sees what? A bush that is burning but not consumed. And he says, I must turn aside now and see this thing. And when he draws near, he hears the Lord speak to him from the burning bush, telling him to take off his shoes because he is, what? On holy ground. So, and what's the bush, dur- what's the bush doing? It's burning. So there's fire. There's smoke. There's light. And there's holiness. And Moses is in communication with God And he receives not only this vision of God, but what does God say to him there in Exodus chapter 3? He says, come now and I will send you to my people in Egypt. Come now, I will send you. Would you say it with me? Come now, I will send you. So there's always a call from God first to come to him before there's a call uh, from God to go to people. It's always first a summons to before it's a commission to go. And that's the, that's the order that's critical. So come, I will send. And so in drawing near to God, in an encounter with God, Moses not only sees the Lord, has an encounter with God, he receives his commission. In the, in the vision is the commission. In the vision is the commission. Not just the conversion, but also the commission. Moses in this moment, his life is completely turned upside down. Moses, of course, isn't the only one. There's Zechariah, the uh, father of John the Baptist. I'll say more about him in just just a moment. Uh, What about Saul of Tarsus? He's on the road to Damascus, and what time of day was it? Remember when he has the vision? It's noon. It's high noon. And he sees one like the Son of Man, and uh, it's shining brighter than the sun, and he's smitten, he's brought down. And he receives not only his conversion in that moment, but his commission. And the Lord says, you are to go now to the Gentiles. So Saul's not only converted in the fiery light of the, something brighter than the sun, 
but he's also commissioned in that moment to take the gospel to the nations. So this, this event in Isaiah's life is something which occurs in the life of other servants of the Lord. John, in the book of Revelation, has a similar experience. After he sees Christ, and Christ is standing in the middle of something. Does anybody remember what it is in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation? Standing in the midst of lampstands. So they have fire. He's standing in the midst of the fire. See, fire, light, all these things are constantly associated with the presence of God. Fiery light. So he's standing in the midst of the lampstands, and then after relating the words of Christ to the church, he hears a voice say to him, this is Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, come up here. Come up here. And so the vision in Revelation moves from the uh, earthly to the heavenly. And when he, he, he ascends, he ascends and he finds himself before the throne of God. He sees the worship of heaven. And what's the song that's being sung around the throne by the elders and the living creatures and the angels, all the company of heaven? What is it that they're singing around the throne? Do you remember in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, 8? Holy, holy, holy. It's the same song that Isaiah hears in his vision. So John, Isaiah, Moses, all of these servants, Saul of Tarsus, they have an encounter with fiery light that changes them, that transforms them and commissions them as God's servants. So what we're given in Isaiah is a particular insight into various details which should help us understand what's, what's going on with such a revelation. We have an insight into the throne of God. That's a remarkable thing. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Well, let's just take a moment and stop for, uh, and think about this phrase, I saw the Lord. You know, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, God is immortal. And then what's the next word? invisible, the only wise king. And we have that in our hymnody, don't we? Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Why is it that God is called invisible and yet Isaiah can say that he what? Saw the Lord. How does he have a vision of the Lord when Paul says he's invisible. Well, in John chapter 1, in the gospel, John says, no man has ever seen God, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. Wow, there's a phrase. That's something else. That's John 1.18. And that, that follows on from these words. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then a little later on, no man has seen God, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. And so there is a way that the invisible, immortal, only wise God makes himself visible to the human eye. How does the holy triune God make himself visible? He makes himself visible to the human eye in the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. All right, so in the incarnation, which occurs in history, in time, we go, right, okay, he's made physically visible to the human eye, and we saw him, but wait a minute. That's the incarnation. That's just 2,000 years ago. What about the pre-incarnate Son of God, God the Son? Was he visible? Yes, 
Yes, he was. Look over in Philippians chapter 2 for just a moment. Philippians chapter 2. So here we have this tremendous and very well-known hymn about Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, have this mind or attitude among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to say the first few words of verse 6 aloud with me. Who, though he was in the form of God. Oh, he was in the what? Form of God. All right, this is pre-incarnate. Watch. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. There's the incarnation. He takes on human form. But prior to that, Christ is living in the what? The form of God. That's pre-incarnate Christ. The incarnation takes the eternal God the eternal God made known even to Isaiah and Moses and so on and brings him before us in human form. So this is the way God makes himself known. There's this um, wonderful passage in A Horse and His Boy, right? In the Chronicles of Narnia and uh, uh, where, where the hero is walking along and he's, he's in a deep mist in the fog and he becomes aware of another presence near him. And being unsettled by this invisible presence in this deep fog in the woods, he, he says, who are you? Who are you? And he hears, and it says, Lewis writes in a voice, said, myself. And then, in a voice that shook the floor of the forest, myself. And then again, soft as the wind, myself. And then, of course, as you know, the mist parts, and who appears? Aslan. Aslan. So, Why does Lewis put on the lips of Aslan an answer to, who are you? The answer, myself. That's very much like what Moses heard, isn't it? What's your name? Who shall I say has sent me? What's your name? And God said to him, my name is, I am. am. (laughs) That's not much of a name, is it? I am. I will be who I will be. I am that I am. Who are you? Myself. And then the mists part. And what happened in the incarnation is the vision which was granted to the Moses and Isaiah figures is given to us all. Who is this God-man? Jesus. He's who Isaiah saw. As John says, he saw his glory and spoke of him. And so Christ is God most high. He is the Lord of hosts, and he's the one that Isaiah saw. Where does he see him? Verse 2, above him stood the seraphim. He's sitting on the throne, and he's surrounded by the seraphim. Now, what we're invited into here is a heavenly liturgy. Now, this scene is repeated in various places around the Bible, Uh, visionary experiences are given to a variety of people, as we've already noted, including Paul again in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. He talks about a man being caught up into the third heaven and seeing things which he what? Is not permitted to actually speak about. Uh, he, he just saw glory, right? It's overwhelming. So people have these apocalyptic visions and they see wonder. And it always involves these 
living creatures around the throne. There's the throne, there's the one upon the throne, and there are these living creatures around it, uh, notably, especially the seraphim. I, I put in your text here uh, Psalm 89.7, and that's an important text, but if you look at, at Psalm 80 as well, it's not in your notes, if you want to just um, look at Psalm 80 verse 1, for just, just we'll go to 89.7, but Psalm 80 verse 1. We, we looked at, at Psalm 80 a week ago on the vineyard, and I just want you to tie in that vineyard song again with Psalm 80 and, and the words of Isaiah 6 now. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. All right, let's just stop there. He says God, he calls God his what here? His shepherd, the one who leads like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim. There's this angelic order. There's the throne, and around the throne are the cherubim. The one who is on the throne, surrounded by the angelic beings, is the shepherd of Israel. All right? So when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he has this song in view, as well as Psalm 23. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, see, we hear that, and we go, oh, isn't that nice? He's the good shepherd. I'm a silly little lamb. I'm so glad he cares for me. But when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, everyone hearing him went, you're saying what? You're saying you're the one who leads Joseph like a flock? You're the one who's enthroned upon in heaven, uh, on, uh, surrounded by the cherubim? What? That's what they heard. They didn't hear, isn't that sweet? All right. Psalm 89. Just go over a couple of pages there. Psalm 89. Uh, one of these apocalyptic moments. Here's what we're being invited into. Verse 5. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness. Now, uh, the end of verse 5, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Does anybody have anything different than the assembly of the holy ones? What else have you got? Huh? The saints, the assembly of the saints. Anything else? How many of you have the word assembly? You got assembly? Okay, saints, holy ones. All right, one of the things that you find in the Psalter is praise God, all you heavens, praise Him, all you oceans, praise Him, stars. Here he's saying pray, let the praise of God beware in the assembly of the holy ones, the holy beings. Okay, so this is heavenly worship. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the, what have you got? Heavenly beings, who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are what? Around him. All right. Now I want you to notice that phrase, the council. Now that's not C-O-U-N-S-E-L. That's council that would be what? That's where we like advice, right? Okay, this is council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L. All right, what kind of council is that? What does that word mean? Yeah, the, this is the advisory board, okay? All right, when Isaiah and John and the other prophets, Jeremiah has this experience too, are brought up into heaven, God says, in fact, through Jeremiah, talking about false prophets, they have not stood in the council of the Lord. That's why they don't have anything to say, God says to him. All right, but they haven't stood in the what? The council. Not council, council. They haven't come up into the council room. You know what I, you know, this is the throne room. The throne room of heaven is also the boardroom of heaven. It's where all the wisdom of God is on display. What? Who's the most wise king in Israel's history? Solomon is the one who stands out. What did his throne look like? Well, it's a great ivory throne, and it had six lions on either side, so 12 in all, and it's modeled after these images. And that was called the court or the council of the king. What Isaiah and John and so on experience is they're being caught up into heaven, and it's not that 
God is alone on the throne. God is surrounded by angelic beings, by the elders of heaven, by seraphim and cherubim. This is the council room. This is the court of the king. That's where they are. And the the psalmist is saying, not only will we worship God on earth, we're going to worship God in the council, in the council chamber, the throne room. All of the heavenly beings are worshiping. They're all singing. And what is that song again? What does Isaiah hear them saying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So this is an introduction into the heavenly liturgy. These are, who's there? Angels, saints, all those who have gone before us, they're there. That's why in the great prayer of thanksgiving in the liturgy of the table, we say, um, well, let's do it. Let's do it, right? Um, The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Ah, very good. Now, of course, in the original liturgy in Greek, it doesn't say lift up your hearts because there's no Greek word for lift up like that. It doesn't occur there. It simply says hearts on high. And the original response in the old Greek liturgy was our hearts are with the Lord. Where should your hearts be? On high. Hearts on high. So what happens in communion? You ascend. You Okay, communion is an ascension. Okay? Communion is ascension. You go up. Many people try to get God to come down in communion. That's not the point. You hear people stand up and lead worship and say, oh God, come down. God came down. At Bethlehem, he came down. Now he has ascended at the right hand of the Father and from thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. But between his departure and the second coming, he's not coming down, we're going up. And when we go up, we feast in his presence. It's an anticipation of the final marriage supper of the Lamb. So lift up your hearts. Our, go ahead. Our hearts are with the Lord. Okay, let us give thanks to the Lord. It's good and right to do so. All the Episcopalians know the right response. Okay, it is good and right so to do. Okay, it's good and right so to do. All right, other Lutherans. Okay, it's good and right so to do. And then, and then the great prayer of thanksgiving is prayed. It is truly Okay, I'm going to go old King James on you now. Meet, right, and salutary. Um, it is good and right that we should at all times and in all places give what? Thanks. Eucharistos. That's where the word Eucharist comes from. Eucharistos, thanksgiving. We should give thanks to you for on this day, and so on. There's different prayers that are slotted in depending on where you are in the church year. There, most of them, well, many of them um, written by Cranmer, others more ancient by Ambrose. We should give thanks to you, and you get to the end of the prayer, therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of your glory. What's happening at the table? You're going up with Isaiah. With Moses, with John, with Elijah, you are being brought into the heavenly council and you are feasting with the Almighty and you are joining the song of the angels. And what Isaiah has here, you are given at the Lord's table. Oh, well, that would be boring. I don't know why I'd want to do that every Sunday. Okay. Ah, All right. Let's talk about the seraphim. The seraphim is a very... Seraph is a a word that means... um, it's just an Anglo- anglicized uh, Hebrew word there, by the way, and it, m- it literally means fire being. But it's a word that in Hebrew is also translated a serpent or a dragon. So, for instance, in Numbers 21.6, it talks about the people of Israel being attacked by fiery serpents. Do you remember that? Fiery serpents, and it leads to the serpent being put on the pole in the wilderness. It's the same word. So, these beings that are next to the throne, these seraphim, look like fiery dragons. Flaming dragons. And they have six wings. Now do you know where some of these images come from, right? Okay, so they have six wings, and they're doing something with their wings. What are they doing with the first set of wings? Covering their face. What are they doing with the second set of wings? Covering their feet. And then with the final set of wings, they fly. 
They go on their, they do their bit, they do God's bidding, they go on their work. Now that's an interesting percentage, okay? Right, that's an interesting percentage. Only a third of their capacity is spent in service, two-thirds of their capacity is spent in what? Worship. A lot more on worship than on work. All right? Of course, we're so like that. Right? <laughs> we were like, well, I don't have time for worship because I got to what? I got to work. And that's, that's just pastors. I'm not talking about you. All right? All right? So, no, no, wait a minute. The, the, here's the story. The beings that God created who dwell most closely to him in heaven spend the vast majority of their time in worship, far more time in worship and in humility than they do in service. Reminds me of John Milton's great poem, On His Blindness, in the last line where he says, they also serve who only stand and wait. That there are times in life where God hedges you in and you're not allowed to do anything. John Milton, on his blindness, you may want to read that. He's complaining about the fact that he's losing his eyesight. And so he's going to find it very difficult to write poems. Lord, how can you exact day, day wages light denied? Uh, Lord, how can you expect me to do this when you're taking away my eyesight? I'm not going to be able to do anything. And, and then he says, ah, but remembering the seraphim, they also serve who only what? Stand and wait. They wait. They cover. Now, this song of the angels is the trishagion. And you can take the H there out of, on your study guide. It says, it's got the H in there. Uh, there. There's no H in the actual spelling. Uh, it, it's trishagion. Uh, it's from the Greek, um, Greek prefix tri, which means what? Three. And uh, the Greek word hagios, which means holy. The three times holy. The trishagion. It's also in Latin called the sanctus, which is the Latin word for what? Holy, the sanctuary, the holy place. So the sanctus, the holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Would you say that with me? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Now this is one of the few places in the Bible where we hear God's essential nature spoken of. There are only a few places. God is light. And in him is what? No darkness at all. God is light. Later, God is love right? Hebrews chapter 10, our God is a consuming fire. Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now of all the attributes of the Almighty that the angels sing, they do not say love, love, love is the Lord of hosts. Now does that mean God is not love? No, he is love. Just, just, just is the Lord of hosts. Well, no, no, they sing what? holy. And they say it three times. Now, in Hebrew, repeating a word twice is done for emphasis. For instance, you come across this in Jesus' teaching. When he really wants to make a point, what does he say? True, verily, verily. Oh, King James. Okay, good. Verily, verily. Truly, truly. Or in Hebrew, amen, amen. Okay, like pay attention. Okay, that double bam, bam, bam. And the same thing happens with names when it's a term of endearment. Uh, um, where God says, Moses, Moses, right? Uh, there's a double use of the name, Martha, Martha, Jesus says, all right? But there's, there's an interesting example of this um, in the book of Genesis when it talks about the, the uh, tar pits that some kings in a battle fell into, and it, it, and, and it doesn't say actually tar pits. It says, because it, it just says pit pits, in other words, there are pits, and then there are pits, okay? So it's like really bad pits, okay? And that could, you know, <laughs> that's what it says. All right, so, and, but, but this is the only time Scripture breaks past two and goes into what? Three. In other words, this is incomprehensible holiness. Who is God? What is God? God is holy, holy, holy. Now, there are echoes here of God's Trinitarian nature, of course, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, though that's not especially in view. What's in view is the fact that who God is in His essence, God is Spirit, 
God is light. God is a consuming fire. God is love. God is holy. But of all of those, God is holy, holy, holy. This is the song which is on the lips of those who dwell most closely to him. The Hebrew word is, is uh, kadash, and it means other, set apart, other. It's not simply referring to something like purity, but rather difference, difference. Let's, use, let's try it that way. We see the Lord and we say to him, you are different, different, different. Different than what? Different than who? Different than all. The creator is distinct from his what? Creation. Now, he's in relationship with it, but he's not the same thing as it. You're different. You're different from us. Isaiah will go on to say, well, the Lord will say through Isaiah, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways, what? And my thoughts? Higher than your thoughts. You're different. Consecrated, set apart, different, other than. To be holy means to be set apart, to be different. One of the things we need to recognize then that God's uniqueness, his otherness, is then given to us as a gift. Because as Peter says, and Moses said in Leviticus, and Peter quotes him in the New Testament, you shall be what? Holy, for I am holy. You too are to be a people who are what? Other. Other. Distinct. Different. You live differently. Everyone else pursues wealth and power. You, pursue, you, 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 you have a different pursuit. You don't pursue those. You pursue the kingdom and God's righteousness. And then all these other things will be what? They'll be, but that's not your pursuit. You're different. You're different. So the Lord is enthroned, and there are beings all around him. Where is Christ enthroned in his glory? Those of you who are in John's study, where was he enthroned? What did he call his glory throne? His cross. His cross. In his death, he is lifted up. Was he alone on the cross? No, he had beings either side. And when they laid him in the tomb in his death, he's laid there, and then Mary comes in John chapter 20 on the first day of the week before it's dawn while it's still dark, and she goes, she sees the stones rolled away, and she goes into the tomb, and she sees the place where his body was lying, but it's gone. There are the grave clothes. But what else is there? Two angels. Two angels. Where are they? On either end. Oh, so if you're a Hebrew person and you see something kind of long and flat and you see two angels on either end, what are you looking at? The Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant. What was placed on the seat. That's called the mercy seat, the propitiation. What was placed there once a year on the great day of atonement on Yom Kippur by the high priest? The blood of the lamb was brought in and placed there. And that's where Christ's body lay between the cherubim. That tomb became the new holy of holies. And that's why when he died, what was torn? The curtain, that's not the Holy of Holies anymore. The Holy of Holies had just moved over here. And here are the angels, and there's the blood. And then he ascended, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne. And all the angels and the living creatures are all around him, and they're singing still, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So, this is the vision Isaiah has. Now, God, in the course of this, and you can fill in the blanks on this, um, gives gives him this vision, and it results in something in him. Again, in the midst of the vision is the commission. And Isaiah, when he has this vision of God, says, woe is me, I am undone. Literally, I'm disintegrating. I'm falling apart. 
um, falling apart. He sees this vision of God's glory and majesty. And here's the thing, beloved. In his state, at that moment, he knows he's not designed for that space. He's not ready for, he's not ready yet to dwell in that space. What's Isaiah become aware of? His what? His sin. I am a man of unclean lips, and it's not just personal sin, but he's, he's part of a community that's broken and fallen. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Sin is deeply personal, but never forget that sin is also deeply communal. And so let me help you with something, because we confess our sins together on a Sunday morning in a joined, shared confession. And so we all say the same words together. And somebody could sit there and go, well, you know, yeah, we're just saying these words together. What's the point of that? I mean, it's my sin. But sin is never merely personal. It is surely personal, but it is also what? Interpersonal. It is communal. We have sinned. I have sinned, yes, but also what? We have sinned. And so there's two parts to that confession of sin. The first part is we confess our sins. And then we always take a moment in quietness to do what? Confess our personal sins, particularly, in silence with God. And then we hear a message. We hear an announcement. I said to you on Sunday, listen to the best words you will ever hear. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Where does that come from? Right here. Woe is me. I am undone, a man of unclean lips, dwelling among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have what? Seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Oh, well, what does God do? Does he leave him in that state? No, he doesn't. One of the seraphim flew to me with those wings. So uh, I want you to see this. There's this giant, fiery dragon (laughs) flying towards you, and he's got tongs. And in the tongs is a burning coal that he's taken from an altar. More about that altar in a minute. And he's flying right at you. How many of you appreciate this is a deeply comforting (laughs) moment? You're feeling, I feel the the love and the presence of Jesus. Isn't Jesus sweet and kind? How many of you, what would you be doing? I mean, you already know you're in trouble, right? I mean, mean, this 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 is Dorothy you know, in front of the wizard. And, and uh, what does Toto do? Pew, right? Okay. I mean, you want out of there. So the dra- fiery dragon's coming with this burning, flaming coal, coming right at you, and he comes up to Isaiah and sh- shoves it right on his mouth. Pew. Oh, this is, that's a comforting. <laughs> comforting. <laughs> There's nothing comforting about it. Verse 7, and he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your Your guilt is taken away. Say that with me. Your guilt is taken away. That's a word of absolution. You're not guilty anymore. Your guilt has been removed. That's what happens when the minister says, whoever's leading worship, whether it's Charles or Ken or Mike or myself, whoever stands up and gives that word of absolution, that's the angel saying, something fiery has cleansed you. Your sins are taken away. They're gone. So then what's our response? Well, we should say what? Hallelujah. Thanks be to the Lord because our sins are taken away. Then Isaiah, a cleansed man now, he, hears the, he, he says, woe. In the King James Version, it says that the angel said to him, lo, this has touched thy lips. So there's the lo. And, and then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. And I know the ESV says, here I am, but that actually should say, here am I. There's a difference. Here I am says, over here, I'm here. But here am I is what? An offering. Here am I. Here I am says, pay attention to me. Here am I says, I offer myself. Here am I is, is the right approach here. Here am I. And when, when Isaiah says, here am I, God says what? Go. So it's woe, low, and go. But you can't invert that order. There has to be a woe, and there has to be a low, and there has to be a go. And if you follow that through in the liturgy of heaven, 
You'll see that repeated every Sunday morning. Because every Sunday morning, we come in, we sing, we rejoice, and we realize we're in God's presence until we confess our And when we confess our sins, what are we saying? Whoa. And then the minister says, you're forgiven. And then here's the word of the Lord, and the scriptures are preached. What is God saying? Lo. And then at the end of the service, I say, stand for the benediction. And what's that? Go. Go. Whoa, lo, and go. Every Sunday. And people stand there kind of like this. By the way, when you get a benediction, somebody, the minister puts his hands up over you like that, you should, you should that, I don't care if you're charismatic or not, that is a really good time to raise your hands right there. Okay? You know, uh, half mast, whatever. I mean, just you know, make a cup, something. Walk out with something, okay? All right? You're, you're, being, you're, you're, you're being commissioned, all right? You know, so receive it, okay? It's a tremendous gift, all right? I'm going to be watching you all on Sunday, okay? All right, okay. So, Isaiah says, I can't bear this, but he receives calling and cleansing, and he's commissioned. This order, by the way, shows up in Psalm 51, David's great prayer of confession after he's been confronted with Nathan about his sin with Bathsheba. And um, David says, create in me a clean heart, O God, right? Uh, take, me, uh, take not your Holy Spirit from me, Cre- you know, cast me not away from your presence, and so on. He says, Lord, purge me, and I will be clean. And then he says, and then sinners will be converted to you then sinners will be converted. The result of cleansing in the heart of God's people is conversion in the hearts of those who are not yet God's people. Then sinners will be converted to you, Psalm 51. If we want to see the world changed, if we want to see people come to Christ, it begins with us confessing our what? Our sins and repenting. It begins with our repentance, not theirs. This self-righteous approach that says, you all need to change. No, no, no. It starts where? With us in a vision of God, a confrontation with our own brokenness, confessing our weakness, our sinfulness, hearing God say, you're cleansed, I'm healing you. It's then when sinners are converted. All right, let's talk about this fiery altar for just a moment, kind of as an aside here. What, is, what altar is the coal taken from? Well, um, Let's go to Hebrews. It's not in your notes, but let's go over there. Hebrews, I think this is the easiest way to do this. Um, in, in the book of Hebrews, we have a description of earthly and heavenly worship. So in verse 2 of Hebrews 9, okay, Hebrews 9, verse 2, all right, let's go over there. A tent was prepared. Hebrews 9, verse 2, a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand, the table, the bread of the presence, and it's called the what? The holy place. Now, behind the second curtain was a section, second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was the golden urn holding the manna. Aaron's staff that budded in the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, he but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and the unintentional sins of the people. Okay, so there's this description of the holy place and the holy of holies, this whole temple complex. Where where did all that come from? Moses had a vision of it. He had a vision of it on Mount Sinai. What is it? What is it that he's seeing? Well, drop down to verse 23. Same chapter. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are the copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. What is the temple of Solomon? What is the tabernacle of Moses. It is a what? Copy of what? Heaven. 
It's a copy of the throne room. So the altar, that incense altar, that fiery altar, is a copy of what? Another altar that's where? In heaven. And that's the altar that the seraphim takes the tongs and goes to and gets the fiery coal and touches Isaiah with it. Now that's not the only time it shows up. Go over to Revelation chapter 8. Well, again, now in Revelation, we've got John having gone up into heaven. So he's there before the throne, okay? Revelation 8, let's pick it up in verse 3. Revelation 8, verse 3. So we've got John up in heaven. He's before the throne. He's having the vision of God's counsel. Revelation 8, verse 3. Another angel came and stood at the, with a golden Sensor. What's a sensor used for? Incense. It's a sensor because it's incense, right? Makes sense. Sorry, it's early. You needed more coffee there. Okay. So, so you got all the burning coals in there, and, uh, and so here it's giving off. Now, I want you to notice this. All right. If you're Isaiah, if you're John, and you go into the presence of God, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. And I heard the seraphim saying what? Okay. And everything's shaking around him. How much of a sensory overload is this? Right? Hearing, seeing. But now with incense, what do you got? The sense of smell, the olfactory sense. This fills us as well. So that's there. And here in, in heaven, in heaven, incense is burnt. He was given much incense to offer with, what? The prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Okay, where's the golden altar? In front of the throne. See, that's where the seraphim got the coal that touched Isaiah's lips. And something happens at that altar. Now, in the copy one, down in Solomon's temple in Moses' tabernacle, the copy the priest would go in morning and evening and burn incense in that golden altar and the smoke would go into and around the throne of God between the cherubim, right? All right, what is, what's it say happens in heaven? What, what goes on that throne? Oh, what goes on that altar, sorry? The prayers. And the prayers have something mixed with it. What? Heavenly incense. And it does what? It goes up before God. Now, here's what I, how many of you think you pray really, really well? Right? I mean, I mean, do you ever, you know, you ever those days, do you think really like you could get really good at it, please? So like if you prayed one day, God would go, Phew. like the father would turn to the son and say, that was a really good one. <laughs> They're really good at that praying thing. No, no, no. Our prayers at their best are always what? They're, 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 they're imperfect. They're always imperfect prayers, okay? Unless we're praying the Lord's Prayer, which is a perfect prayer because it comes directly from Jesus. Our prayers, we, we're, they're misguided, they're mixed up, we don't know how to pray as we should, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, okay? So, but the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings too deep for words. In the heavenly council, your prayers go to that altar and incense is added to them and they catch on fire. And then they go up to God. So that when they come before him, what do they smell like to God? Ooh, Cassidy. No, no, no. What do they smell like? Sweet, sweet. All that you offer up to God in prayer, it comes before him because it's mixed with fire and incense on the altar that's before him. All of that comes up before him. And it's beautiful to God. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's why when we pray together on Sunday mornings, that's one of the most beautiful, when, and when somebody stands up here and leads us in prayer and then we pray the Lord's Prayer together, I want you to get what's happening. I've got to get this to you guys. I've got to get this to you. Your prayers are ascending and they're being mixed on this altar of incense before the throne of God with the incense of heaven by angels. See, the priests in Moses' tabernacle and the priests in Solomon's temple are with their robes mimicking who? Who are they the copies of? The angels doing the mixing. Okay? So it's all offered up. 
And as it's offered up before God, God receives it. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, and he did something with it. What did he do? Threw it on the earth. Your incense goes up, and then what? Fire comes down. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and tongues of fire rested upon their heads. They were all praying there in Jerusalem. They waited. They were gathered. They were waiting in prayer. When people pray, when God's people gather to pray, it's incense up. Psalm 141, verse 2, let my prayer to you be as incense and the lifting up of my hands is the evening offering psalm 141 verse 2 your prayers are incense and they are mixed with the incense of heaven and it's incense up and fire down you want to know why there's a lack of fire in the church and there's a lack of fire on the earth it's because the people of god have stopped praying it's not preaching but praying that lies at the taproot of the power of god being released in the world it's not boring liturgy. It's like, oh, crumbs, we've got to come on Sunday again. It's incense up and fire down. And it doesn't mean necessarily that you'll have fire in that meeting. It means that the fire may break out all over the world in ways you could never know or comprehend or understand or even ever know about until you get home to be with glory. But it's incense up and it's fire down because he threw it on the earth and there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. The earth quakes and the lightning flashes. All trembles because God's people offer up incense and it's mixed there on that throne. That's the altar that the fire being came and took a coal from and cleansed Isaiah. Are you getting this? This is an incredible chapter, my friends. Incredible chapter that is, is happening here. Okay, how much time have I got? Oh, I don't have any more time. I just want to say... One last thing to you here about the message and what happens here. This, this word comes here to Isaiah and says, this has cleansed you. Now remember, he said he's what? He's, woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Unclean, uncleanness was ceremonial uncleanness, especially associated with what disease? Leprosy. All right. This has taken your, your it's all gone now. Remember, and, and Charles read this to us from Mark's gospel on Sunday. Jesus, after he healed the leper, said, go show yourself to the priest and show him that you're healed so the priest could announce it. That's the official announcement, that you are healed. That was the verification of it. Here's the verification that the leprosy is gone. This is performative speech. The declaration that you are clean performs the thing that it says. There's such a thing as performative speech. It happens all the time in a wedding. Two people walk in single in a particular relationship, but when they get to the front, they exchange vows and the signs of the covenant. Then the minister says, at the penultimate moment of the service, I now, you, husband and wife, what therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And ladies and gentlemen, now, here's the ultimate moment of the service I present to you, Mr. and Mrs. There's the presentation. How, they, did not, they were not Mr. and Mrs. when they walked in, but now they are. When did they become Mr. and Mrs.? When the minister said they did. It's performative speech. And when God says to you, you're cleansed, what does that mean? By golly, it means you're cleansed. I don't feel very cleansed. Well, try that sometime with your spouse. I don't feel very married. And they'll say to you, I don't care how you feel. Better act like it. (laughs) Because you are. It's not a question of your feeling. It's a question of the word that's been spoken over you. You're justified. It's not about the condition of your heart. It's about the disposition of the Almighty towards you and me who are forgiven people. It's a declaration he makes concerning us, not on the basis of anything in us or done by us, but it's a declaration concerning us that is based only and exclusively in what Christ has done for us on the cross. Because of what he has done, you are clean. That's what that is. Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw Christ. Well, we have to stop there. And we'll pick up next week on the message.
of Isaiah. I wanted to get further today, but I got a little too into fiery dragons. Let's stop there. That's a lot to take on. All right. So questions. I see Christ being. As we see Christ be represented as a Savior. Mm-hmm. And as we see the blood put on the altar of sacrifice. And as we understand your scripture that even the tears of our eyes are all yeah. in heaven. Yeah. Is it plausible? I'll repeat it for you, yeah. Is it plausible to assume the lack of blood of Christ to be the instrument that you are praying for someone to come? Well, you know, okay, so what's being asked is whether or not the blood of Christ is part of the incense, okay? I don't know that it's part of the incense, okay, but it's the basis of it, all right? Because Christ's blood, all right, here's how John puts it. Um, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, right? But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And he goes on to say, I've written these things to you so that you don't sin. But if you do, you have a advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ pleads for us how, how long? Always. The blood of Christ is pleading for us right now, right now before the throne, the blood of Christ. Sometimes people will say to me, are my future sins forgiven? You know. <laughs> In which, of course, I point out to them that their past sins were future um, when Christ died for them. And so, of course, they do. Because, but, but the reason your future sins are forgiven are not, is not because you prepent. But, <laughs> but, which I do every morning. I'm like, well, Lord, you know, I'm about to blow this. I'm breathing. So, um, uh, but because the blood that he shed is eternal. It's eternal. It will never, as the old hymn says, lose its power. Never. Okay, so it's perpetual. So it's always pleading for you above. That blood is. Right. Great, great question. Others? Yeah, Diana? What spaces? Thin, thin, thin spaces. Okay. Yeah. Earth. Yeah. Have you heard that term? Can you, yeah. Yeah. Can you speak to that? I can. I th- okay, so Diane's asking about what are sometimes referred to as thin spaces or places where earth and heaven meet, okay, where there's an encounter with the, with the invisible world and the visible world. I believe in such things. Um, sometimes those can be dark. Uh, demon possession is an example of an invisible world entering the visible world, and uh, taking up residence. But there are also other moments. The incarnation is, a, is the supreme, glorious moment where the invisible world becomes not just present in but part of the visible world and makes the visible world eternally part of the invisible. Christ does not cease to be incarnate in the ascension. He is fully God and still what? Fully human. Fully human. But there are moments where God in his mercy and in his grace does at times grant to people, and who knows why or how this happens, these kinds of visionary experiences, the kind of thing Paul talks about where he says, I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, 2 Corinthians 12, was caught up into the third heaven and saw things about which you're not permitted to speak. All right, so there's a catching up. Paul had those kind of visionary experiences. The prophets had those kind of visionary experiences. Those things occur, but they're rare. Sometimes those of us who are not prophets, just average ordinary people, have those places. Hebrews says, make sure you show hospitality to all because some in doing so have entertained unaware, right? So yes, in the biblical view of the world, in the biblical view of creation, the invisible is first. The visible world owes its existence to the invisible world. In the same way that Solomon's temple and Moses' tabernacle are what of the heavenly things? Copies. Okay. So trees. We have trees. They're beautiful. Where's the original tree? Heaven. Right? We have a rainbow. Where's the original one in the book of Revelation? Around the throne. Okay. 
We have birds. Where are the original winged creatures? Heaven. Where's the original eagle? In heaven. Right? What we see in the created order is a copy. That's why the Scripture says God will make not all new things, but all things new. People sometimes think, well, you know, um, what, we're going to lose out on all this beauty. No, all this beauty is going to, going to get amplified. It's going to go into what it was originally meant to be. The curse is going to be gone. The whole creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And until that day, there are occasional moments, there are transcendent moments where the invisible world and our visible world meet. Uh, the apostles had this on the Mount of Transfiguration, didn't they? Who did they see talking to Jesus? Moses and Elijah. I think that's a vision that was granted just to them. I think if you'd been strolling by, you wouldn't have seen anything. But their eyes were given that vision. You would have just seen Jesus standing there having a conversation apparently with himself and three sleeping apostles. But their eyes were opened and they saw Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus and Jesus in all of his glory, they saw something different. Um, so some of you may have experiences like that and they can be quite breathtaking. I wouldn't want to say more than that because I wouldn't want to talk about necessarily my own little glimpses occasionally but that, have, were, were, that I feel like have happened for me because that would sound too much. But um, it's not normative and uh, we shouldn't expect it. It should be shocking, right? But we should be aware of it. Sometimes people who've lost someone to death will experience their presence in a unique way. Those kinds of things, right? Uh, you may, you know, you know, that happens. You go, how, can you explain that? No, that's the answer. <laughs> but, but do not ever think that the world that created this world is out there somewhere. No, it, we exist in it. We exist in it. And it is one with us in many, many ways. So, thin, very thin membrane. Others? Well, sorry, we're going a little bit slowly on this chapter. I have, I'd hope to go a little bit more quickly, but there we go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the vision of Isaiah that he saw Christ would you grant such a vision to us as well? And remind us, especially when we gather on the Lord's Day, that with John in the book of Revelation, we can be in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and see things that others may not. Remind us that we are with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. And grant to us to sing the holy, holy, holy with them. Amen.